Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. What did Jesus do when he was tempted by the devil? He quoted scripture. It's almost laughable that Satan, a created being, could lead God incarnate astray. But Pastor Greg Laurie points out Jesus responded how we should. He's giving us a model. This is what you do when you're tempted. You quote the Word of God. This is why you need to study the Bible. And then when you are tempted, you can pull out the appropriate scriptures to defend yourself. This is the day when the lost are found. mistake to follow Jesus' example. In fact, that's implied in the definition of follower or disciple. We're walking in the footsteps of Jesus. And today on A New Beginning, Pastor Greg Laurie takes us to the dramatic moment when Jesus had a confrontation with the devil himself. It was the moment the saviour of our souls crossed paths with the accuser of the brethren. But Jesus chose to make it a teaching moment for all of us as believers who encounter the scourge of temptation. Sometimes the question is asked, why do we have four Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, the answer is, each Gospel has a different objective. Let's start with Matthew. Matthew was written primarily to the Jewish person. There are many passages in Matthew that show how Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecies, how he was the long-awaited Messiah of Israel. It begins with the genealogy showing that Jesus is Messiah. Now Luke, in contrast, written by Dr. Luke, a physician by trade, is very poetic. Uh, we have some very unique passages in his gospel that are, are not in any other gospel. For instance, the story of the prodigal son. And the beautiful Christmas story, as Luke tells it, is like no other. Luke was primarily showing the sympathetic ministry of Jesus. Now John, he comes from a completely different perspective. He goes back to eternity it starts his gospel with these words, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John was specifically written to convince a non-believer to believe. So where Matthew was written more to the Jewish mindset, showing Jesus was the Messiah, John is written more to a secular mindset, showing that Jesus is the Son of God. And that brings us to the Gospel of Mark. It stands apart from the others. Well, unique to Mark is he does not record all that many sermons of Jesus. In fact, Mark focuses more on what Jesus did than he does on what Jesus said. It's a record of the achievements of Jesus, if you will, and it's action packed from beginning to end. It's a short, concise book of 16 chapters. And by the way, it's probably the first of the Gospels that was written. So let's read some of this Gospel together. Grab your Bible or your phone or your tablet or wherever you have your Bible and read these words with me if you would. I'm in Mark chapter one, look at verse nine. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and he was baptized by John and immediately coming from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now look at this. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was out among the wild animals and the angels took care of him. We all know what it's like to be tempted. We've all felt the presence of temptation, haven't we? Heard about a guy whose wife yelled from upstairs and asked her husband, uh, honey, do you ever get a shooting pain across your body like someone's got a voodoo doll of you and they're stabbing it? He said, no. And then she yelled, what about now? <laughs> now look, that's just a silly joke. Voodoo dolls aren't real, but Satan is. And temptation is real as well. 
Now he faced three temptations by the devil. And in effect, you and I will face these same three temptations in life. Here's the first one. Now I'm going over to Luke chapter four who fills in some gaps for us that we don't have here in Mark's gospel. In Luke chapter four, verse three, Satan says to Jesus, if you are the son of God, tell the stone to become a loaf of bread. You know, it's worth noting that Jesus never did a miracle for his own benefit. You know, if Jesus had to get from point A to point B, he walked there like anybody else. You know, if they had to walk from uh, Galilee to Jerusalem, he could have airlifted himself over there if he wanted to, but he would walk with his disciples. Thus, Jesus was tired like we are. Jesus was sleepy like we are. Jesus was hungry when we are. I mean, he could have done whatever he wanted. He could have been eating an In-N-Out burger, gone forward in time, grabbed that thing, eating it, and the disciples would say, Lord, what is it that you're eating over there? And he could have said something like, it is not for you to know these things. Just eat your fish and unleavened bread and I'll get back to you. Or he could have just met them in Jerusalem, just popped over there, but no. He put himself under the restraints of human frailty. Now look, Jesus had a physical body. He was tempted and tested, but he did not have the inward vulnerability to fall. So he felt the presence of temptation, but being God, he didn't really have a sinful nature that would incline him to give into it. The Bible says he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. So yes, he had a body. Yes, he bled like any man. He had tears like any man, but he was God walking among us, fully God, and fully man. There has never been a man that walked the earth like Jesus. So if this is the case, what is the point of him being tested? Here's the answer, ready for it? To show us how to face temptation. He's giving us a model. He's showing us what we should do when temptation comes our way. Hey Jesus, says Satan, why don't you turn a rock into a piece of bread? What does Christ say? He says, it is written, Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now look, we face this temptation all the time. Here's the essence of what Satan was saying to Jesus. Put the physical before the spiritual. He'll come to us and say, hey look man, you need to have a little fun. Uh, You know, you can play now and pay later. Don't worry about the repercussions of sin. Uh, You'll be okay. You're the exception. God's okay with this. You can trust me, Satan says. That was the hissing of a snake in case you missed it. Listen, the Bible says the devil is a liar and he is the father of lies. And sometimes people get their lives out of whack. You know, they, they put physical things before spiritual things. Look, there's nothing wrong with eating food. God has given us food to enjoy and, and to eat together. But uh, there's a difference between eating to live and living to eat. Some people are obsessed by their appetite. They're obsessed by food. They're obsessed by things. They're obsessed by sensual things. And they let those things become more important to them than God himself. So just put God in his rightful place in your life. It's fine to have a career, but don't put your career above God. It's great to have a relationship, but don't put a relationship above God. So by saying men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from God. Jesus is simply pointing out that we should have our spiritual priorities in order and put God first. Thanks for joining us for A New Beginning with Pastor Greg Laurie. We're learning some important lessons today about temptation as Pastor Greg helps us consider the way Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness. Let's continue. Here's another thing, and we don't want to miss this. What did Jesus do when he was tempted by the devil? He quoted scripture. Now remember, Jesus was God. And be God, he could have said, Satan, be banished. And Satan would have left. He had that authority and power over the devil. But he didn't do this. He faced the devil as we should face the devil. He said, well, how? Well, first of all, we quote scripture. He's giving us a model. This is what you do when you're tempted. You quote the word of God. This is why you need to study the Bible. This is why you need to memorize the Bible. 
Over in Psalm 119, verse nine, it says, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Psalm 119, verse 11 says, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Look, it's good to carry a Bible in your briefcase or in your purse or have a Bible app on your phone. But the best place to carry the word of God is in your heart. So don't just get it in your mind, get it in your heart. Commit it to memory. And then when you are tempted, you can pull out the appropriate scriptures to defend yourself. So the devil realizes that this first temptation is not working. Now he does something really strange, or it seems strange to us perhaps. He's giving Jesus a hack, if you will, a shortcut. He's effectively saying in this next temptation, look, Jesus, we both know why you're here. You're here to purchase back that which was lost in the Garden of Eden. And I'm gonna make you a deal you cannot refuse. Bad Godfather imitation. <laughs> I'm gonna give you what you want. I'll give it to you on a silver platter. All you have to do is give me the satisfaction of worshiping me for a moment. Look at Luke chapter four, verse five. The devil took Jesus to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give to you and their glory. It's been delivered to me. And then the devil says, and I can give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all of this will be yours. Jesus answered and said, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. I heard the story of a woman that was gonna go down to the mall and her husband said, no, I don't want you going to the mall. Every time you go, you buy something. She said, no, I'm just gonna browse. I won't buy anything. No, you always buy something. I don't want you to go. We can't afford it. I'm just gonna look. He said, all right, look, but don't buy anything. She said, okay. So she comes home a few hours later with a brand new outfit. He goes, well, I, I asked you not to go buy an outfit. What happened? She says, well, I walked by the store. There was this cute outfit in the window on the mannequin. And so I walked in and asked if I could try it on. He goes, oh, I can't believe you did that. Well, what happened? She says, the devil himself appeared. And he came and appeared in the dressing room and said, you look great in that outfit. And then the husband said, you should have said, get behind me, Satan. She said, I did. I said, get behind me, Satan. And then the devil said, hey, it looks good from the back too. <laughs> no, but seriously, when the devil tempts you, you don't want to listen to him. You don't want to have extended conversations with him. You want to put him behind you. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Now we come to the last temptation of Christ, at least in the wilderness. And this is in Luke chapter four, verse nine. The devil brought Jesus to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle or the peak of the temple, and Satan said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Notice, the devil then says, for it is written, he will give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they will bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Wow, the devil's quoting the Bible. Did you know the devil knows the Bible too? The story is told of the famous comedic actor W.C. Fields who was known to be an alcoholic. And one day someone was surprised to see Fields actually reading from the Bible. He said, I can't believe that you, W.C. Fields, are reading the Bible. Why? And Fields responded, looking for loopholes. <laughs> and that's what the devil's been doing for a long time. Reading it, quoting it out of context, misusing it, looking for loopholes, if you will. Question, can temptation be resisted? Answer, yes, all caps, yes. In fact, God will not allow you to be tempted above your capacity to resist because 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God who is faithful will not allow you to be tempted above your ability to resist. Listen, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Think about it. Think about the last time you were tempted. Was there a way out? Answer, of course there was. Sometimes it's as simple as walking out a door. Sometimes it's simple as hitting the off button. Sometimes it's as simple as terminating a conversation. There's always a way out, and listen to this. Not only is there a way out, but there's a blessing attached to the man or woman 
that resist temptation. James 1.12 says, Happy is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So if you're going through a trial right now, you're going through a time of testing or temptation, know this, you can get stronger through it instead of weaker. Let me conclude with this thought. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about how Jesus began his public ministry. Why did Jesus come? Let me go back to what I said earlier. Jesus came to buy back that which was lost in the Garden of Eden. What was lost? Our relationship with God. We're separated from God by our sin. But Jesus paid the price on the cross for each of us so we could come into this relationship with the Lord. And you can come into a relationship with Him right now. You know, maybe there's something you're doing right now that you're ashamed of. A lifestyle that you're trapped in. An addiction that has a stranglehold on you. And you don't see any way out. Jesus can transform you. Jesus can forgive you. Jesus can give you a second chance. Listen, the same Jesus that was born in that manger and was tempted by the devil in the wilderness and died on the cross also rose from the dead. And he stands right now at the door of your life and he knocks and he says, if you'll hear his voice and open the door, he will come in. Would you like to have Christ living inside of you? Would you like to be free from the power of the devil? Would you like to find this meaning and purpose in life that can only be found in a relationship with God through Jesus? If so, I'd like to lead you in a simple prayer. And I would ask you to pray this prayer after me if you want Jesus Christ to come into your life. If you want to be forgiven of your sin or listen, or if you want to make a recommitment to Christ because you've messed up like John Mark did earlier in his life. God gives second chances and third ones and fourth ones and on it goes. So if you need Jesus in your life, if you want his forgiveness, if you want to know with certainty that you'll go to heaven when you die, or if you want to make a recommitment to him, why don't you pray this prayer with me right now? Just pray these words. Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin. I turn from my sin now, and I choose to follow you from this moment forward as my Savior and Lord, as my God and my friend. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. An important prayer from Pastor Greg Laurie with those making a change in their relationship with God today. And if you've just prayed with Pastor Greg and made a decision for the Lord, we'd like to help you get started in your new relationship with Him. We'd like to send you a new Believer's Growth Pack. It's full of helpful resource materials to help you in your new journey. And all you have to do is ask for a new Believer's Growth Pack when you call 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's 1-800-772-936. And the team would love to pray with you too. Call 1-800-772-936 today. Next time on A New Beginning, Pastor Greg Laurie helps us consider the amazing things that can happen when we allow God to work through us. We'll see that Scripture is replete with examples of ordinary people who did extraordinary things for the kingdom. Today's message from Pastor Greg Laurie was called The Gospel for Busy People. If you'd like to listen again, just download the free Vision Christian Media app where it's available as a podcast, along with more inspiring Christian content. Just search your app store for Vision Christian Media. Station sponsor. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.